Hello, guys. David Voth here. Oh, boy, it's a beautiful day in Oklahoma. It's clear skies and sunny. A little humid. But that's Oklahoma. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Well, want to jump on here and try to do another video today. Didn't do one yesterday. You know, just... I'm just in a different place right now. Uh, a little bit transitionatory, or however you would say that. I'm looking for another place, and, um, so I'm spending some of my time looking online and looking for places to live and kind of not feeling it and not sure where I'm going to be going. But I can't stay here the place that I was, my cabin, there's various things going on. And so I'm spending a lot of time doing that. And of course, in these hot summer nights, I'll sit here in the evenings with a glass of wine. And, you know, I have for all my life, ever since I was, I can remember, I have spent a lot of time thinking. And I think I found a way. I used, I remember my dad used to say that Einstein, he was infatuated with Einstein, my father, used to talk about him. My dad was an electrician. And so he liked science. And he used to tell me about little things from time to time. He'd say something. Of course, my dad didn't ever talk to me much. And didn't pay a lot of attention to me growing up. So I was infatuated with my dad, you might say. And just about everything my dad ever said to me, I remember. There wasn't that many things. And they were all very profound. And I probably got more out of a few little statements that my dad made than you could really even imagine getting out of that. Because... With every statement that somebody makes, there's a lot of wisdom in it. You know, sometimes we're repeating some wise statement. We're all doing that. We're like, hey, did you see that news article? Or, oh, hey, there was a famous saying that says, you know. And so we're always kind of repeating things that we've heard that made sense. But think of how amazing this is. You may not have ever heard this before. If you've watched my videos, you might have seen parts of this before. But this is amazing. The entire world reads the New Testament and the Old Testament. And they think it's a story. Um, you know, we make the nativity scene and we, we're constantly talking about the children of Israel being led out from Egypt and there were a couple of million people out wandering around in the desert and they walked through the Red Sea and it parted and there was all the play, we, you know, the story of Noah and all these stories. Now, Christianity says this is our book. This is what we believe. Well, then the world started publishing all kinds of books. We got a typewriter, right, in the modern age. And we started getting familiar with stuff that they taught over in India. We started hearing about some of the things that the Druids taught or people in Africa in ancient times believed, or Babylon or other places. And we heard some crazy stuff. I mean, like, oh, well, let's see. Um, they believed that there was a place after you died, you went to the Elysian Islands or you went to Tartarus, the lowest pit, and some demonic being ruled over your soul, a hateful, wicked being that the Greeks called Hades, and then later... Because of fear of his name, they didn't want to say his name, just like the Jews did with the Yahweh. They started calling him Pluton, or Pluto, as we say it, which is Apollo in the Sumerian, Apulio, and in Greek it's also spelled Apollo. And that's over and over in the New Testament, but we didn't notice it. So, the oddest thing in the world to me, as I grew up and began to see these little things, Popping up all over the place. One of the first ones we ever saw as Christians 
that we had no idea was there that tells the same story as all the other ancient teachings in the world we had no idea that we believed in. But we saw from the very beginning that there was this serpent that talked in the garden. Well, that's exactly the same story that the Sumerian tablets tell, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, and the Akkadia and the Sumerians and all the other ancient peoples of the world. But it didn't stop just for some similarities. There was a garden, there was the father of the gods, there was two serpents that guarded the way the tree of life, there was a tree of life, a tree of knowledge, <clears throat> there was the garden, there's the story of creation, we've got the story of the flood. Now remember when we were, you know, maybe 50 years ago, Christianity was saying, oh yeah, other nations have the flood story, but only our flood story is true, right? His name's really Noah, it's not Gilgamesh or, or something, you know? So, but, you know, it really got more involved and very tellingly, the world appeared not to care when it got really, really, really deep. When the New Testament started talking about the angels that fell and was thrown into Tartarus, it couldn't possibly have anything to do with Zeus um, cutting his father's belly open and saving his six brothers because his father Kronos ate his brothers. And so, you know, Zeus takes these beings that he defeated, the gods that he defeated, and throws them into Tartarus. And it's called the Titans, who were thrown into Tartarus. Right? These uh, Titans are exactly the same story that the Greeks tell, that we tell in the Hebrew and the Greek. So in the Hebrew, it's the Nephilim who fell and took uh, daughters of men, and he, they chose and created government and began uh, courting mankind and making religion, making man slaves, ruling over them. There were wars. This is in the Bible. And it's exactly the same thing. And what we find out is that the gods that is in the Old Testament and in the New are exactly the same gods that are in the Bible. It's the same exact story. And this is why Jesus always spoke of God as Theos, which is the Attic Greek Athenian spelling of Zeus. And the reason they use the Athenian Greek Athen spelling is because this entire religious mythological story came from ancient Egypt, was transferred, the pharaohs transferred it to the Ptolemies, and the Ptolemies translated it, or transferred it to the Caesars. And it's in all the world, and there are these specific bloodlines that were royal bloodlines that went into all the world and taught their peoples exactly the same teachings because they were the sons of the gods. But they didn't want the ordinary peasants to become members of the family of God. Only they were members of the family of God and got to go into the temple and eat all the dainty food and didn't have to work like grunts. They weren't slaves. But there was some, even in the laws that these ancient deities made for mankind, even there there was hints that one day mankind would become free of all of this. But it was either established over the objection of human beings as a great big fraud to keep man in slavery, or it's a parable about something that is even more amazing. In other words, the thing that's keeping us enslaved is not a being at all. It's not even a reality. It's something that you can slay. You are the dragon slayer, and you can take the sacred sword of the spirit, this is a double-edged sword, and you know, put on your uh, um, your suit of armor, your shield of faith and your helmet of salvation and your girdle of truth and your sword of spirit. And you can go forward and fight this spiritual battle and win. So what we've got here is a mystery. And this is why the Apostle Paul says, look how I know the mystery. And I speak of Christ and his church, the great mystery. But he was 
talking about marriage, which is a ceremony. And he explained, and the other apostles explained, that all of these writings, these ancient writings, were warnings and instructions for us upon whom, whom the ends of the world has arrived. For written for our edification and for reproof and setting matters straight. And that somehow in these parables, which is what they were, there would be a mystery and to those to whom it would be revealed would be eternal life. But in spite of the hiding of these truths inside these mysteries, some of us were really fascinated with knowledge. You know, I could tell my dad was interested in in some things, but I also could tell, with and, and this is not about my dad, this is about everybody I've ever known. I could always tell, ever since I was a little boy, that most people were very sentimental. I don't know if that's the best word, but it's a good word that came to mind. Because this sentimentality seemed to make human beings dumb. And the reason why is this, and I, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we're being intimidated and we're, we're, there's a lot of pain in the world. So a, a, a man, for instance, or, or you could use a woman as an example, but take a man who has to go out into the world and work. We have to work very hard. I mean, a lot of you youngins don't know what work is, but 50, 60, you know, years ago, when men got a job, it was usually something very, very laborious. It was a difficult job. It was, there were a lot of John Henry jobs in this world. I mean, think about it. Just all the work originally was very difficult work. Railroads had to be brought from the East Coast to the West Coast, all across this nation. Roads had to be built. And they didn't have big tractors and trucks to bring in all the cement and stuff like we do today. People hauled it by hand. They, they made the roads a lot more with less advanced tools than we have today. And they worked very hard. John Henry used a, a hammer to put those railroad spikes in the ground and you can imagine back in those days these guys would hire somebody who could do the job and they paid them very little so there was a lot of difficulty in life in the world it was hard it was very hard and so i feel that most people who are in this world, are navigating the world based on the principle that they're trying to not work so hard. And that's logical, right? They, they don't want to have to work so hard. So for most people, I think what they did was they thought that if they applied themselves and went to school or worked real hard and made it up to management, just, just don't give up, then they'll get into this cushy, position where they make more money, they're more like a boss, and they can tell people what to do. But I think that the reason why that course of action didn't appeal to me so much is because I didn't have any, like, I, I would see a boss as somebody who was abusing people and getting them to, like a, like a, a slave overseer. I saw the world that way. I thought, this is a mundane task where it looks like the world is trying to advance to some goal, which I didn't have an opinion about it one way or the other. I didn't really know why we needed all these amazing, fancy things in the world, these big cities and all this stuff. I thought, you know, it was complicating things because people were moving away from their families. They had these nice cars and they'd move away, and then people didn't know their mothers anymore. And... uh the more it seems like the more people advanced, the stupider they got. And then everybody was running down to the doctor and they believe everything or the scientist or, you know, uh, oh, I've got to go to work. So let's put our kids in kindergarten or, or preschool and just let the government raise our children. So I never really approved of any of this anyway. But when I saw so I when I saw people 
in the world and the way they believed. I didn't think they were studying facts. I didn't think they had a good way to think about the world. I think they were deceived by virtue of the intimidation coming from this world. You know, that you must work or do what we say or we'll put you in jail or, you know, or hey, you're not going to ever get married or have kids or a family or a life if you don't do what the church says or whatever it is that intimidated people. All of the hard, hard, hard work and, and life itself, because there was lots of snakes and ticks and you could fall down and break your leg. There was all kinds of problems in the world and you had to be careful. And so people were then afraid of all kinds of things around them. In the ancient times, they put a name to this thing. It's called Hades. It was the god, or at some point down the line, they ended up calling him Pluto, which is where we get the Greek, well, in the Sumerian tongue, they called him Apulo, Apulo. And so the, the Romans called him Pluto, which is from the ancient Apulo. But you see, Hades was much like Yahweh in that he was the one God who you couldn't say his name. Now, why is his... See, we always was told when it came to Yahweh that we weren't allowed to say his name because it was too... It was, an in, it was the ineffable name because he was so amazing. You couldn't, you couldn't conceive of him. He was so great, right? So don't even say his name because it's, you might be using his name in vain. He's so powerful. He's so great. But you see, that's not what the Bible says. That's just something that the, the church has said to people to explain why you're not allowed to say his name. Because, you see, the Bible doesn't say not to say his name. The Bible says we're supposed to use the name of Yahweh to curse people. And see, this is another thing that Christians have no concept of. The Old Testament is full of curses. And Yahweh is primarily a God of curses. The entire law is a curse and a bondage. The first thing he did when he found Adam and Eve was he told them, don't do this, and if you do, I'm going to curse you. And when they did it, he cursed them, and he cursed them all. And the law was, was the only blessing in the law was that there were evils in the world that the Lord would not put upon you if you keep the law all perfectly. But you see, it was just a parable. Basically, it was saying is, is, is that you go through life and life is very, very difficult. You better be intimidated and you better be scared because something might happen. And when you make that mistake, well, then the way things are, you see, there's a reality. There's a kingdom and there's a God who rules over that kingdom and he's the God of vengeance and he's going to get you. So you need to be scared. And so they originally felt so frightened of this deity who would punish you, who would get you. He's going to get you. And you had to do everything he said. This was the intimidation. So they were afraid to say his name. And they never would say Hades' name. So this is why the Greeks end up starting calling Pluto or Apollo. So they went to the Sumerian name. And this is where we get the word Apollo. And in fact, another thing that most people don't realize is that in the book of Revelation, it says that there was this beast who was but is not, but will ascend into, it uses the word into, will, 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 will ascend into perdition, the scripture says in, in our Greek translation, which perdition is another one of those words that doesn't mean anything in English, right? You got to go look it up and then that'll go back to another language, which, oh, you don't know what that means because, you know, there, who knows, it's a dead language. So we'll go back to another language that's even more dead and try to figure out what that means and maybe we'll figure out the root. No, that's ridiculous. I'll tell you, perdition is the word in Greek, Apollo or Apuluto or Hades. And he's the one who has the keys to death. Because he has control of the law. So in the Sumerian, this god who overcame the Abzu or the abyss, see the bottom of the realm, the darkness, he took over his father's kingdom, the Abzu. He killed his father Abzu and tried to kill his mother. Well, I think they made a pact. But 
he was they, he was asked if he would please kill his mother Tiamat, the seven headed dragon. But he either couldn't do it or didn't want to. Well, his son Marduk came along and tried killing Tiamat. And there are stories that he was accomplishing that. But the whole point of that was is that he was trying to get rid of the intimidation of all of the the, the fear of all of this, uh, the death. I mean, this was the God that, would, that could come along at any moment and just kill everybody. And we tried to get rid of that, see. People were like telling the gods, the heroes, oh, please save us from this death, from all the bad things in the world. So they were so scared, is what I'm saying. People were so scared that they couldn't think. They couldn't use reason. They couldn't make any sense out of the world because they were too scared. You know, they, were, they didn't have any time. They were out working like slaves. And they weren't given any books and they weren't, you know. So they didn't have a premise and all of their premises that they had were faulty. Every idea that they had been taught was false. They were told they were slaves and that wasn't true. Because you see, Jesus came along and told us that that God was a liar and he was a murderer. So I, from a very young age, noticed that most people were so scared. They're like, you ever seen a little bunny rabbit just sitting there? He won't move. He's like frozen. Because he thinks if he's real still, you won't see him. He's scared out of his little mind. And if you start to move or come towards him, and he thinks, ah, oh, nap, he's seen me. Well, then he's got to decide, okay, do I have a better chance of just not moving? Maybe the lion won't see me. Maybe the human won't notice I'm here. Or is that human or that lion or whoever's the wolf, is he getting too close? Because it looks like he might be coming towards me. And he's constantly thinking in his mind, am I going to die here? So he's like, I think I've got a real slight little moment here. I need to run and I need to run fast. So that's what that little rabbit's thinking. He's just, even when he's out, you know, foraging for food one day, takes little um, Mr. Cottontail with him, you know, and, and his sister, Aunt Peter Cottontail, right? And and they're out foraging for food and, and playing and stuff, but mom's constantly thumping her, her foot, you know, and, and now, now children, be careful, watch out, there's danger everywhere. And so that little rabbit, can't really enjoy himself fully because at any minute here comes the wolf or here comes so he's con he's got so he's got to have defenses so they make underground holes for protection so you see even if mice were intelligent or i should say rabbits if they were really intelligent beings they really wouldn't have time to sit around and debate how many angels could sit on the head of a pen because they're too busy building holes to protect themselves from the big bad wolf. So what I'm saying is, is that most people that are in this world were born into a culture. In other words, before they got here, the world had already been taken over by somebody bad. And they were already intimidating people. And so they had made a world, because, you know, humans can't really make it on their own too easily they like they're gregarious they like company they're they dwell in families and units and they help each other in fact the human race would go away if there wasn't male and female of course all animals would but we like being together and spending time and having fellowship having dinners and banquets and parties and you know, like that mother rabbit, we're worried about our children. So we're constantly thinking, I've got to go get a job. I've got to provide food for my children today. I've got to make sure they're safe. There's all these dangers and you're scared out of your mind throughout your life and you can never learn anything. So I said all of that because I want you to understand that when I was a little boy, when I looked at people, I felt different because I felt more or less like the binding or the tie that most people had to this world and its culture 
which kept them frightened and, and not able to know who they were or what they believed or what they should believe. They just believed whatever some religion told them or whatever doctor or anything like that. And they trusted the world because they they didn't really trust. They were just scared. They, they, they didn't want to die. They wanted food and shelter and protection. Well, so at a young age, I realized that I, I, I kind of felt like I could see and I noticed that fear on people. I noticed the, you know, sometimes they'd be laughing and smiling. And to me, it looked like they were more or less trying to convince themselves they're happy. Like, come on, let's find something to do. Let's do something. Let's get my mind off all this fear and panic inside myself. Right? I feel guilty. I feel bad. Nobody cares about me. I think I am lost. I don't know what to do. But, you know, I don't want to think about that. You got some drugs? <laughs> let's forget that. And let's just, you know, I've got an, a, a day off from work. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm not going to think about philosophical things. I'm not going to waste my time trying to figure a way to escape this world. I'm not going to read unless I'm told to read a certain subject so I can learn how to pull that crank because I've got a job that says to pull the crank, you know, and I've got to learn how. Because my only concern and focus, I only have time for one focus, and that's to feed my family. So everybody was like that. But something happened to me when I was little where I somehow internally lost that tie. I didn't feel like... For some reason, my goal, or I somehow I didn't have that fear of being out in the woods and stranded. So, therefore, I must go and work for the man because I need a house or I'll die, right? I felt more, like, less, of, less restricted. Like, if the worst thing came to the worst, then I could deal with it. Um... I feel like maybe that had to do with the fact that most people were born and raised into this world in a culture. Their parents believed the going belief system. Like if you were Greek speaking peoples in Greek times you would believe you would have been told all the Greek mythology and the stories of Zeus and and um, Gaia and you know and and uh, Hades and all of these deities and there were morals to the stories that they were teaching the people and the moral was always well there's evil in the world, and there is some good in the world, and we're trying to get to the best good. The best good is to do what you're told, because if you ever get into the hands of Hades, or if you ever die, you're never coming back. It's a lost hope. The whole world believed in this. They had developed this system where they believed that we lived in what... The, it's it's kind of like the Hobbits. Have you ever read the story of J.R.R. Tolkien? He spent years writing that book, uh, starting way back, well, I think it was 1930s when he started writing that book. But I don't know how many of you have watched the, the movie. It's not based on any actual writings or anything. It was a, It's a novel. But it seems to be based on European folklore kind of like. There's hobbits in it, kind of like elves. There's elves in the story and stuff like this. So you might say it was more or less kind of the uh, King Arthur legends and the knights and, and the elves and the fairies and the princesses and all of this stuff that was going on in medieval Europe. And in this story, they had this place called Midgard or the Middle Earth. And they lived, sometimes they called it the Middle Earth. And it was it was basically the, the, some say, oh, it was the big continent that they lived on. Well, it might be, and it might be referring to Earth itself because it, 
the story seems to take place at times in a place called Northwest Middle Guard or Middle Earth, the Northwest part of it. Well, if you look at the Earth and you look at the biggest continent, which is Asia and Europe and this whole thing, um, the Northwest part is Europe up around Britain and Germany. So it appears that he was kind of inferring that he was basing the book on ancient, oh, philosophical, esoteric wisdom, like Druidism. And, of course, it's very similar to all the ancient histories. So in this sort of, if, if you look at some of the maps that J.R.R. Tolkien made of this fantasy novel, you'll see that it looks a lot like people who believe in the flat earth. And one of the things that they call the earth in in the Lord of the Rings is what they call this thing. Um, they call it Adar. I don't know. If you look at all the words that he uses, they're always words that are different than any other culture. They're not, he didn't plagiarize this word for word out of any ancient book or anything. But a lot of the words certainly do have similarities to ancient wisdom. And Adar then sounds a little bit like, uh, Earth, you know, Ard, Ard, Earth. Um, it's, you know, because words after a thousand years come down to us with slightly different letters. Maybe they sound the same, like D and T, Adar, or Ether, or Ether, or Ether, or something. But also, Agartha is a little similar to Adar. But whether or not he meant that, you know, as just accidentally or not, I, I don't think so, because when he says the Middle Earth, and he talks about a place kind of like hell and heaven, that's exactly what the ancient esoteric wisdom believed. But what did they really believe? Because mankind has had this more or less cosmology that they've taught mankind for thousands of years. But it seems like this cosmology that they taught everyone, nobody really understood it. It seems like it was originally talking about concepts rather than geography like the gods were all the forces that are in our lives love and hate and war and the sky and the earth and the sea and the trees are all gods and they all affect humans and there was one part of life that was very scary and that was death and pain and all of that and and so that was relegated to the below the area below would get you right you don't want to go, when you die, you, you you go back to the earth. And under the ground, there's snakes and there's fire down there. And so under the ground was the kingdom of Hades. And like I said, everybody was scared of him. Now, there were elves, that, there were individuals in, in the story that lived only in the middle earth. But the humans, there were humans in the story too. They were in Middle Earth, but they could eventually get out and fly into yonder heaven. They could, their soul, no, elves and I think hobbits reincarnated. And humans, it was never said in the, in the story of the Lord of the Rings, whether or not they incarnate. It was assumed that they might, but their eternal destiny was such that they could ascend out of this world and get out of the realm that was influenced by the dark realm below. Because that deity from the bottom in the darkness that everybody obviously knew was real. I mean, I was, you know, people die, right? Well, if there's a, a loving deity, there must be an evil deity. And so you had to appease him. So they had, they would give offerings to the gods and they had, there were many servants of the gods. So sometimes you just met one of his servants. You could never met, meet 
the god Hades in person, right? <laughs> he would melt you with his breath. I mean, he was evil. And you didn't want to talk to him. But he would come and rape Mother Earth. And they would uh, sort of breed all these evil demons that would constantly be after us. But there was hope because uh, Valar, which is very similar to Valor, Love, or the, uh, Valencia, or Valor, you know, the, the words that we use. But Valar was an angel from the realm of heaven. And so there were certain hobbits that decided that they needed to go and find Melkar or whatever, who would come and battle with the demons and the devils and overcome this and save the Middle Earth from um, the machinations of the evil that was going on in the, in the center. So what was the cosmology there? Nobody really knows. But he draws maps. And there's this continent, and this is supposed to be Middle Earth. So where's heaven and hell? Well, you couldn't see heaven from Earth, nor could you see hell. Okay, Those were other dimensions and other realms, but they influenced the Earth. So it's not really like a flat Earth. Now when you draw it, the Middle Kingdom is physical and real, but the other two aren't. So those are only represented in symbolic fashion on the you know, on the drawing. And so today, because people aren't familiar with this ancient cosmology, people assume that maybe it was a continent, which was the Middle Earth, and that there's around the Middle Earth is the Great Ocean, and beyond the ocean, maybe there's other continents. Maybe the Earth is flat, or maybe there's a wormhole, and we go off into some other dimension. But nobody really knew. But what we did know is that there was some something that had to be figured out. There was some lesson to be learned on this earth. And only certain individuals would ever have immortality and attain unto the light. And I use the illustration of this book because it's almost as valid as if you were to use the Bible or Greek mythology, because really, all of this is just parabolic of the situation we find ourselves in. And the only way that we're going to be able to figure this out is with honesty, and we're going to have to find a way, which I think I was able to do when I was a young man, we have to find a way where we can get our mind out from under the fear and the intimidation where we're able to really ask ourselves some serious questions. Because it seems like, according to the Bible and these other books, this God who lives in Hades, who is the God of the law of evil, that, that the punishments and 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 is restricting you because of his law, right? The world and all the problems in the world are there because of him, because you did something wrong. So we have to navigate this evil. And, and it seems so impregnable. It seems so hard. Um, it, 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 the, the sages and the ancient ones would, would ask the question, is this situation just eternal? Is it the only way that we can exist? Surely we're going to live and then die, and then what happens? Is there something better after death? Well, the only way you're going to come to an answer is you're going to have to be able to sit and think. But you're not going to be able to think and come up with good answers if you're afraid and you're being intimidated. Not to mention the fact that you wouldn't have the time because you're out working and slaving for this other god and bowing and groveling at his feet. So you're just not going to have... You're not going to be able... You know, it's like you're just not giving, giving your mind the secret 
uh, uh, magical words. Abracadabra. Voila. You've got to know the, the magical words. And the, and the only way to find the truth, to get to the kingdom of truth, is you have to be seeking for it. If you're already conditioned within yourself to believe and accept the world around you as it is, that this evil God is just there and we must feed him, so let's go out and sacrifice him. They've given up. People that go out and sacrifice upon the altar of Satan or any God who demands sacrifice, who isn't love, any God who, who says he'll wipe you off the face of the earth if you don't get down and do an act of worship to him, any God who demands that you murder others, or if you don't believe in them, you have to be murdered, or if others don't believe in him, he wants you to go and murder them too. You have to be able to be fearless enough to stop and say, you may have power over me, but I know you can't take this from me. I know who you are. You're evil. And I know I don't believe in you. And I know that at the moment I'm afraid of you. And that's my problem. I'm so afraid of you that I'm your slave. Because I don't know of any other option. And that's the situation that ev everybody in the world seems to be in. We're out of our mind afraid. And so, the millions and millions upon millions of things, little pieces of glitter flying around, thoughts that they've told us, conditions that they've given us, jobs and situations they've put us in, it seems like all of that has got us believing in a false reality. And so the, the great mystery of this puzzle is that this evil God, you see, this is the mystery. How could this evil God exist if the God of love exists at the same time? And so the great Ancient sages knew this, but their students had to learn it on their own. But they could never learn if they didn't have faith. Because if you're afraid of the devil, imagine standing in, in a dark cave and a dragon sticks his long, nasty, winding little neck like a serpent neck all the way down inside the cave but he can't quite get all the way in the cave because he's too big to fit in there and your back is pressed up against the back of the wall and he's reached all the way about three feet in front of you is he, he his nostrils are breathing down your your neck with his hot breath but he can't quite reach you well it's at that point where you know that you are outside of his grasp and you can speak freely. And then you say to that devil, you nasty, wicked devil, you may kill me, but you will not take my soul. I know who I am. I trust and I love myself. I am not your slave. I won't allow the guilt that you're trying to put on me to stay with me. And in fact, I now realize that you're only a figment of my imagination. That the entire world really is a product of what I believe. And mankind, when they were young, when we were in ancient times, just trying to make it, all the wars and the fear... It made people crazy, made people scared. And they just didn't have the time to philosophize or to understand, to, to, to 
reach down deep within their soul and find that place where the true and living deity is, where the God of love is. Our Father in heaven, who is love, he would send down his angels. He would send the bunny rabbits and the butterflies and the eagle would fly by and the dove would land on our shoulder from time to time and whisper in our ear, but we couldn't quite hear it because we were so mesmerized by this fire-breathing dragon. It looked fierce. Of course, wrath is more frightening than love. Of course, wrath held us mesmerized. Death and the fear of death all of our lives. But all we have to do is cease being afraid. Because it's when we're not afraid that something special happens. It's when we believe in ourselves that something special happens. It's when we have a moment to trust our own thoughts that something special happens. Because all of our lives, we weren't trusting anything we were thinking. We were thinking, well, huh, I think I'm a good person. Don't you say that. You're an evil person and you deserve to die and go to hell. Oh, okay. Huh? No, we, had no, we did not entertain any idea that we were okay. Right? We would walk up to people and think they hated us. We just assumed why everybody should hate us, right? We're, we're worthy of, of no nothing because our rulers told us from the time that we were born we were just slaves, that we were guilty, that if we didn't do everything we were told, we would go to hell, and that was scary. So it takes faith. And in a moment of release when we release all of the lies when we cast out all of the demons and how do we cast out these demons only through faith and we have to have faith in somebody's name ah uh, the name of the god you know like melkar or al uh, valar or whatever in the book i mean the name of the deity of heaven Don't forget about heaven. You know, you're too busy thinking about hell and scared of death and dying and, you know, and all of this. But you forgot about heaven. Heaven is redemption. Heaven is forgiveness. Heaven is love. And heaven is the truth, the reality. What you're looking at, that kingdom, see, the middle world is the conscious world. It's influenced by both the higher thought and the lower carnal, lustful thought. It's influenced by both, but only the lustful thought seems to win on very weak souls. Only the fear seems to move a person who is young and inexperienced. It takes experience to learn how to do things and to become accustomed so that you don't jerk with nervous fear, so that you're calm, so that you can raise that bow up into the air without shaking, without a dragon after you. And when you finally graduate the Academy of Truth and you've learned how to shoot your arrow because you're not going to be afraid and because you trust yourself and you believe in yourself, then you become a warrior for the reality, for the truth. And you shoot your arrows of truth. And they land on other people. And you can then open up a new world to them and give them the good news and help the lower carnal world just melt away and his power just seem to go away. The ancient Greece concepts for heaven and hell are, of course, different in many ways than those propounded by Christianity. But in other aspects, they closely mirror the horror and the 
ecstasies of these places that we associate with today. Like the Christian concept of hell, the Greek underworld had a ruler who was closely associated with his domain, Hades. Remember, Jesus gave the parable and he was giving the actual Greek teachings. Jesus was quoting what the Greeks taught. And he used the Greek words. It was, he didn't use Hebrew words. And he was talking about Tartarus, which is the lowest realm of Hades. And he was talking about this great uh, gorge that was in between them, like a great river. And on the other side of the river was the Elysian Islands. And when you died, the boat Chiron would come and take your soul. And if you were bad, you went to Tartarus, or some people went to other realms in Hades. Depending, I mean, it seems like some of the Greek gods would go to all the way down to Hades, to the bottomless place, because they could never come out, evidently. The boat never came back for them. Now, originally, there were concepts where the Elysian Islands were only for the gods. But, obviously, that was not the way most people saw it. And after a while, in Greek mythology and in Greek um, teaching, they started more or less saying that all the good people, when they died, they would go to the Elysian Islands. But that wasn't necessarily heaven. But Jesus talked about it as the rich man who died and lifted up his eyes in torments. And he saw Abraham uh, in paradise, across the gorge, feasting at the table. And all the, the good people and all the saints were having a great big fellowshipping meal, a great party, right? But this other guy, because he had done some things wrong in his life, he ended up in this place called Tartarus, where there were flames of fire and he just wanted a drop of water cool his tongue so that is what these Elysian Islands were friends what we're talking about right here this may seem mythological and ridiculous and why are we talking about this but this is the story of the New Testament that Jesus very clearly taught the Apostle Peter taught this very point that we're just reading now about Zeus freeing his brother from his father Kronos's belly and this is in the book of Peter as the angels who fell and were sent to prison. They were bound in Tartarus. So this is relevant because, you know, as Christians, we think this is all true. So we need to know then what really are we talking about if it's true. Because it says here, perhaps from fear of even pronouncing his name, Around the 5th century B.C., the Greeks started referring to Hades as Pluton. Pluton, with a root meaning wealthy, considering that from the abode below come riches, fertile crops, metals, and so on. People would sometimes refer to him as Zeus Catachithonius, meaning the Zeus of the underworld. By those who felt they had to avoid saying his actual name since he had complete control over the underworld. Hades, as the god of the dead, was a fearsome figure to those still living. In no hurry to meet him, they were reluctant to swear oaths in his name and averted their faces when sacrificing to him. Since to many, simply to say the word Hades was frightening. Euphemisms were passed into use. In addition, he was called Climenius, notorious, Polydigmon, who receives many, and perhaps Eubelius, good counsel, or well-intentioned, all of them euphemisms for the name that was unsafe to pronounce, which evolved into epithets. This is exactly what the Jews did with their deity, Yahweh. They got so scared of upsetting the God of vengeance that they refused to say his name for fear that they would say it in vain. So it says that the Greeks then uh, thought that since precious min minerals come from the under the earth, the underworld, he was considered to have control of these. Uh, 
Sophocles explained the notion of referring to Hades as Pluton with these words, the gloomy Hades enriches himself with our sighs and our tears. See, this word Pluton is, of course, the, the Latin word for this god, Pluto. But, and no, and not the cartoon dog. <laughs> Disney used the same name for that dog. But Pluto is the god Hades. But they didn't like saying the word Hades, so they started saying Pluto. Well, the Latins just said Pluton. And this comes, like I said, from the Sumerian Apulon. And this is where the Greeks get the word Apollo or Apollo. So he spent most of the time in his dark realm, formidable in battle. He proved his ferocity in the famous Titanomachy, the battle of the Olympians versus the Titans, which established the rule of Zeus, according to the mythology of ancient Greece. Feared and loathed, Hades embodied the inexorable finality of death. Why do we loathe Hades more than any god, if not because he is so ad adamantine and unyielding? The rhetorical question is Agamemnon's in Homer's Iliad. As his birthright, Hades received the underworld, Zeus the sky and Poseidon the sea. But the earth, which had long been a province of Gaia, was open to all three gods concurrently for any actions they wished to carry out. Hades was often portrayed with the three-headed guard dog, Cerberus, sacrificing to Hades involved black animals touching heads to the ground. Hades was not, however, an evil god, for although he was stern, cruel, and unpitying, he was viewed as a just one. Hades ruled the underworld and was therefore most often associated with death and feared by men. See, this is how people think of Yahweh. Well, he's not evil, Dave. His vengeance, so why it's just. He has every right to kill everybody. Why, he's God and you're not. Okay? It's the same lingo. What they were trying to express was the fact that it's just reality. But, the reality is not what you think it is. It's not inevitable that we suffer. But there is a mystery. And this is why it's all written in parables. Whether you're Greek or... In the Old Testament, it's written in these parables for a reason. Because you have to be able to grasp a very, very, very complicated parable. And that parable is life itself. You see, why does the... Why does everything that this particular God says don't do... Why is it that everything he says don't do is crying out to us to do it? In other words, he says don't um, sleep with a woman or whatever. She's not your wife. Okay. Well, why is that woman so beautiful then? Why are people having trouble resisting her advances? She's luring you. Now she's got makeup on and she's got this low-cut blouse and this tight-fitting skirt and high heels and she's waltzing over to you real slow and she's got a drink in her hand and she's offering you some wine and okay wait a minute now we're not supposed to do that but she's trying to get you to do it see if anybody had ever stopped to think about what this parable is actually saying but you need some time to think don't you at first, you just believe it. Oh, it's literal. I've got to be scared. Ooh, don't ever touch her, but I can't stop. Right? It's part of my nature. Every time I see a girl, I think of girls. So the very nature, my very nature is going to cause me to go to hell. And, and, and of course, this deity who's evil has every right to take me out because he told me and he warned me, don't do it. And you knew better. But you couldn't help it. So therefore you were consigned to fear and the ultimate eventuality would be death. Except that what you didn't know was that there's another world, a higher world. And you don't have to live in the lower world. You don't have to be... Your consciousness 
doesn't you like if if you live in the middle kingdom that's the conscious world of earth it looks like it's a physical reality but it's influenced by two other realms and when you finally realize that it's influenced by your own imagination by your own beliefs and that is what's getting you into trouble because in actuality This God is a liar. This whole kingdom of consequences, death, brutality, and pain doesn't exist. You see, it's, it's all a matter of perspective. This was the great mystery. That mankind's been going around for thousands of years. It's like nobody's ever really learned it because every time somebody grasps this mystery, somebody comes along and murders them so they can't tell anybody else. They write a book, they, they burn the book. There's a, a vested interest some people have against you knowing this fact. But here's the great mystery of this weird cosmology that every nation has on the face of the earth. The middle kingdom is the conscious world. So we call it the earth. It's the only kingdom that really exists. It's the only, you know, you can only act in the kingdom of reality, where everything manifests, where the trees grow. You'll see the sun shining down, but you can't live on the sun. You can look down in the holes of the earth, and maybe if you could dig a hole away to the core, you might see fire. But you can't live down there. You live up here, and all of the creatures live here in Middle Earth, including the elves and the hobbits. And the humans. Now there are lots of different varying stages of evolution on the earth. There are little elves that are half the size of humans. They're not, obviously, they're, they're not developed. Okay, they're underdeveloped. And so it's not in their, um, future to leave this world. The, the reality, you see, they're bound by whatever, you know, remember, there's two areas, heaven and hell, that have an effect and are influencing the earth. And so if you're a little guy and you're not fully developed, then you're below the middle point, below, you haven't developed any special powers, to be able to get out of the influence of the the bad qualities on the earth. You're, you're still navigating all of the bad things. But, you see, the navigation part has nothing to do with how big and physically strong you are or how many magical words you possess in your vocabulary or whether you've sinned or didn't sin or anything like that. That's the illusion. The illusion is what? It's a parable. If you look at life as not an illu as an illusion, but as a parable, to, as though it's something to be figured out, the mystery of your own soul, because you see, really, there's no physical universe anyway. It's all perception. The being has no time and space. But it it's peering at energy vibrations all around. There's just energy and swirling forms and shapes. And when you have knowledge, if you have no knowledge, you're bounced around from pillar to post, just like a pinball machine. You ain't going to get anywhere because you don't know. Any, you don't even know that you could move and navigate. You don't know that yet. You're just being bopped around. And, 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 and so every time you hit a post, it hurts. And after a while, it hurts enough to where forces you to sort of wake up and try to figure out where you're at. So it serves a purpose for those who have not yet developed the concept of where they're at or who they are. They're just flying around and they're, they're being uh, influenced by every outside influence, every outside force. They succumb to every willy-nilly little thing because they're not whole or complete 
They haven't gotten to a place where they are king, where they are their own master. But they're under the influence of the influencer. So imagine, then, if you found out the key that this other world that we call hell is really within us, and it's the lower part of us. We call it that. We give it the name lower because it's lesser and because it's lust and it doesn't have self-control, but just it's just being sucked into something without knowledge. In order to develop self-control, we have to have spirit, which is a flowing river that comes from our Father in Heaven, which is a um, thought process. It's thoughts that come down out of the sky, okay, from above. And they're inspiration. And they give us feelings like joy. Why would they give us joy? Because they give us knowledge. They tell us who we are. And when an angel whispers in your ear and says, you are amazing, you can do anything you want, see, then we soar. But when the devil says you're you're guilty and you're bad, then you run and hide. But you don't have to hear the devil. See, this is what you have to finally realize is that the voices are coming from two places. The lower realm is a place, a mind, the mind of the flesh. The realm of deception and lust and hate. Once you realize that that deity is your ego and it dwells within you and it will never let you go free as long as you're afraid of it, as long as you worship it, that's all you have to do is reject him and receive with faith the deity from heaven, which is the light, which is love. You can't do both. You can't serve them both. So, you see, when we have not yet figured all this out, mankind for a thousand years are running around and they're hearing the voice of the ego and his wrath. And they're scared out of their mind and they never develop. And then other individuals begin to enslave other individuals based on this fear. But as soon as you understand that you are not guilty, that your father... In heaven is different than that deity. That deity don't love you. He will not forgive you. But it doesn't matter. Because that's a part of yourself. That's the cocoon that's going to... You're going to shake it off. That's the lower part. You're evolving and you're going to fly away. You're going to get your wings. You're going to go... Remember, you have to live in this conscious world. The reality. But what you're going to do is you're going to cease believing in the devil and all of his lies. And then you're going to have the recognition of the Christ within you. And when you do that, he sends you the gift. And the gift is that whatever you ask, you shall receive. And then you will have passed over from death unto life because you have looked at the ancient parables, the ancient esoteric wisdom sent down by the gods who... They, when they put them on the earth, told us that we should meditate upon them and pray and get the sense of it and wake up for the day is at hand and we must go forth as children of the day for the night is far spent. It's high time we wake out of sleep. And we understand all of these ancient teachings that or in every ancient religion or nation or kingdom upon the face of the earth. Anyway, I think I'm going to go ahead and just leave it there today. Um, we'll get back at you guys tomorrow and hope you have a really great day.